introduction and then hey do uh right. you, need to, you need to uh have control of the computer christy uh yes please okay okay so while christy's getting that set up i'm going to welcome everyone to the tuesday april 19th uh, finance and facilities meeting regarding the budget and today we are going to be discussing adult education facilities and transportation and we're going to start with a presentation from christy monroe who is our adult education director and welcome and christy would you rather we do questions at the end or are there places you'd like us to interrupt you um you can feel free to interrupt that sounds good Let's see. And she may have hit the wrong button. Uh, while she's coming back on, um, Pete, are, is Steve and, and Ray, are they coming in later? Steve and Roy are not coming in. I'm going to do it for them. They both okay. need time off. Ray, Roy just got uh, an eye replaced, a lens. Mm -hmm. So he's uh, he was working today, but he, uh, I, I he really sounds like he needs a night off. <laughs> I, mean, I, I think he does. And he's just very excited that he has 2020 envision in one of his eyes now. Oof. It's good for a okay. driver. So you'll be doing those presentations. All right. Sounds good. And actually, before Christy starts, or while she's getting set up, Pete, this would be a good time to talk a little bit about the... The adult education budget is something that we have as an article, but it's not included in the general budget, if I understand correctly. And I'm, I'm actually still a little confused by that. So can you just give an overview for our new members and anyone watching? So the adult education uh, has its own general fund budget. So that's the 1500 coded budget. And we do uh, adopt that by the board and the public. And we do subsidize that to an extent uh, in the $200,000 range for the local support of that budget. But the, and Chrissy can go into some of that. Um, request. Oh, oh, there we go. Okay, <clears throat> great. She, she can go into more of that because it's, there's about four or five or more funding streams for adult education, as well as a enterprise fund kind of component where it's self-sustaining uh, for you know some of the enrichment programs when we have had them or self-sustaining a travel program you, we don't support those programs uh, but there is a component the 1500 fund that is the general educate the general fund portion of the adult ed and that's what we have the board vote on and the public vote on okay so before just one quick question to follow up and then we'll let christy um begin and but so where exactly in the budget is that? So you mentioned 1500, but I don't feel like I've ever really seen adult ed in the budget. So where would I go to look for it? I'll do a separate one. Christy and I, we're still working on the final version of that to make sure that we had get the numbers right. We're doing, we're doing payroll parts of it now, but you'll you'll get a copy. You'll get a, a budget version like you do the general fund budget. Okay, so I guess- this is a larger question that I'm just going to flag for to, if you can add to, well, I'm not sure when we'll be adding that, but just to make sure it gets answered at some point. Um, so it seems like this general education budget isn't the whole budget. And so I think that's something that is high level that um, is worth going over so that we all understand and understand what we're actually voting on. Okay, that's that's the key. <laughs> Christy, you're up. Okay, great. Um, can you all see my presentation? Yes. Okay, excellent. Um, all right, off to a little bit of a rocky start with the technology. So what I'm going to um, give you all is just sort of the, the overview of adult education and um, where we are, what sort of our trends are, and, and then um, our enrollment information. And uh, looking ahead of, of the, the needs and how we have that's worked into our budget going forward for next year. Um, so the theme for adult ed seems to be, and this is adapted from a presentation that was given to the Rotary, um, but folks are, um, they assume that we are enrichment programming and um, 
GED. And that's not necessarily true um, trending going forward. In fact, our program doesn't even really focus on enrichment. So we are split up into hubs, nine hubs across the state. And these are all of the programs that are in our local hub. So all of these adult education programs, we all work together. Um, we are funded off of a lot of the same grants. And the um, great thing about working together is that we're not in any sort of competition and we can help. We don't all have to do all things. The Knox County Regional Programs are um, Five Towns, RSU 13, Midcoast, which is um, Madomic Valley and um, Sheepscut, and um, Midcoast School of Technology. So Midcoast School of Technology um, focuses on like the workforce development and enrichment portions of adult ed. And then RSU 13 adult ed is um, the high school completion academics um, portion. These are the different um, sort of adult ed statewide. These are the basic services. So we have high school completion, um, English language learning, workforce training, enrichment. In our program, we only have main driving dynamics as an enrichment program. Um, college transitions and adult transitions. The uh, one of the major grant sources is the AFLA grant, which funds adult ed across the state, and that comes out of um, the WIOA um, Act, and we're really funded under that Title II Adult Education and Family Literacy Services. Um, the the tenets of this are, are, um, are complicated and it goes through a lot of federal um, and state systems. Um, I'm not gonna get into all of it, but it, there's, there's a lot of our policies um, and how we serve students are dictated by this WIOA. Um, this is um, just sort of an example of a lot of the different um, funding streams that are coming now through adult ed. We used to just have, you know, our state subsidy, local share, AFLA, and Maine College and Career Access Grant. Um, but there's all kinds of, like in the last couple of years, all of these other um, funding opportunities are presenting themselves. And uh, they're not necessarily to directly um, fund adult ed programs, but they can either help community members um, access training and employers to have access to training as well. So the focus um, for small businesses, which is what we have been asked to um, work on going forward is really building that workforce development piece of our education offerings. And so, um, there's a few, there's a few different funding sources that um, that are coming up that are that are pretty exciting. Um, Harold Alphonse Center funds um, for any employer that applies, um, they can offer individual employees up to twelve hundred dollars for um, training, upskilling, um, and that is. Um, that's through this year. And then going into next year, they'll cover 50% or up to $600 per employee. So um, that's a pretty amazing opportunity for people. Um, and so we've been talking a lot about how to utilize that. The WIOA um, funding names targeted populations and business sectors that um, we are tasked to serving. Um, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of opportunity there. Our, our local RSU 13 adult ed focuses on academics, which is high school completion, whether it's um, the high set, which is what used to be known as the GED um, or high school diploma completion. Um, we have college transitions, 
which is a, a pretty amazing opportunity for anybody who's looking to get back into school um, or is currently enrolled in college and needs some extra academic tutoring. Um, English language learning for adults. Uh, we have our workforce training. Um, we are looking to develop employer um, partnerships and seeing what the training needs are in our community. Um, we currently offer digital literacy technology training. And um, we also currently offer advising, um, career advising and career access advising. Um, so anybody who's interested in uh, changing their path of employment or um, figuring out, you know, how to um, get the training that they need in order to um, get a, a better job or a more enjoyable job, they can come in and meet with our uh, academic um, and career advisor. Um, and we have a lot of resources there to help people kind of find their path. Uh, a couple of examples recently, we had um, somebody come in that, you know, wanted to uh, be a licensed massage therapist. And so we were able to um, help them find the, um, the best training resources locally and um, any grants and scholarships that will help them um, to get there. And then as they're working through their program, if they need any academic support, then they can come back to us and get that as well. The other piece um, with um, Maine College and Career Access right now is that Adult Ed statewide has partnered with the community college system and students who enroll in the Adult Ed MCCA program have um, access to one free community college class um, per year. So a lot of our students who are high set students who are you know, at McLean working on, towards their high set, they are able to um, sort of practice um, taking a free college course through um, the community college system. And then moving on to our enrollments, and this is so far this year, and it's, it's pretty consistent, like looking back over the last five years, we have had um, an uptick in enrollment since, um, since COVID, which is uh, interesting. I think that the distance learning option really has made it a lot more accessible for folks. Um, so right now we have, um, a total of 108 uh, academic students that we um, have served or are serving this year. And then those are broken down into adult basic education, um, high school diploma completion, high set, main college transitions, and English language learning. We also uh, manage an after school arts grant from the Anonimo Foundation, and we partner with um, the 21st century after school program and um, a few other community groups. And um, we've had 133 students this year in that program. And some of the things that we've worked on, um, for example, our group did murals at Rock City um, and at the apprentice shop. And there's so many more places in town that are requesting that our students um, come and, and do murals. So um, we have a pretty great uh, group of um, youth leaders that have gone through the program and are now uh, you know, juniors and seniors in high school that work with Alexis Iamarino to um, do the actual design um, work. And they work with um, you know, all of the, the community groups and, and things that are needed in order to get the permitting. So that's a that's just a, a little extra thing that Adult Ed is doing here locally. Um, oh, and also the, the relevance of the 34, 16 to 20 year olds uh, is that when we do reporting, um, those 34 students will be added into the, um, the subsidy from that you get in the K-12 system. Um, looking forward um, to next year, 
we um, are seeing a trend of more students that are needing um, accommodations for learning disabilities. And what that means is a lot more time to prepare um, and more one-on-one -on -one tutoring instruction. So um, you'll see in our budget for next year that we've added some instructional hours for that. Um, distance and blended learning trends are up and uh, we have um, joining us in a couple of weeks, a distance learning coordinator, um, which is a position that we were able to um, fund under the district's um, ESSER funds. And so that's a, a limited time position. And um, that's really pretty exciting because, you know, there's, there's so many opportunities and people are really able to work around, you know, like barriers like childcare and transportation and all of these things that um, pre-pandemic were, were things that people were dealing with. And since we've all now learned how to use this technology and, um, and it's, you know, been legitimized to be at it in, you know, earning credits from a distance, um, there's just so many more opportunities. So that's um, going to be really exciting to have a staff person that can um, really focus on that piece. Um, there is a whole added component of sort of getting people um, on board and, um, you know, logged into all of the different uh, platforms that we use. Um, okay, so employer partnerships to provide workforce training, which is something that we're tasked with. So what we're looking at for next year is to start by using um, RSU 13 as the employer. <laughs> and, uh, and we've met with um, Stephanie and um, Janet and really brainstormed a lot of the training needs that um, that are um, present in the district. And then adult ed will be able to um, plan those classes around that. Um, also bus driver training, um, helping to um, meet the, the needs of, um, of that curriculum as well. Um, then, we are also tasked with getting word out to the community about all of the different um, opportunities, whether it's um, you know new state funding um, or just in general. Um, you'll see the high set is having a huge campaign um, in May and June, uh, and there'll be a lot of signage and things going out around the state for that. But we're we're tasked with getting the word out. And so we locally are working on some different marketing campaigns where we've got some grant funding that can cover um, those. And our big focus is um, social media, which we haven't really had a presence in social media in our district. It takes quite a lot to get that set up and managed. Um, and so we're working with um, Dream Local as a hub and using some um, grant funding there to have a hub um, social media presence. And then once we have our distance learning coordinator on board, we'll start to work to develop our RSU 13 adult ed social media platforms as well. And hopefully with some um, paid advertising there, we'll be able to get it in front of more eyes. Um, and the, the big push there is to let people know that they can go from, um, you know, basically from where they are in their education, they can go through the process of um, getting their diploma, um, getting enrolled in college and being able to, um, to navigate, um, their resources to get the certifications and trainings um, that they need in order to enter the workforce or um, 
or have a, a more um, pleasurable job experience. And I believe that is it. Questions, Chelsea, you must have. <laughs> I do, but I try not to start <laughs> questions. Um, so Dave, do you have any questions? We're down, by the way, we usually have more people, but we're down half our, half our normal folks. Dave? <laughs> I have two sort of, your year-to-date numbers didn't add up. Are there duplicate entries in there? They're enrollments. So students might be enrolled in more than one category. And the distance, le the distance learning coordinator, um, you said it's that's, that's a temporary position? It is. Okay. So when the funding goes away, the plan is for it to go away? Um, or that more funding will be um, found. You know, that there's a hope that, there's a hope that through a lot of the grants and resources out there that we would be able to continue. And also it's a new position. So we'll see how, you know, if it's able to, if it's able to get the traction to be able to be, you know, effective in the way that we, that we're hoping. So we'll, we'll see. All of your budget comes from sources other than taxes? Our budget is a mix of local um, taxes, state subsidy, um, state grants, federal grants, and private grants. But, the, but, the, but your budget is not in the general budget. But last, so, year, the, uh, <clears throat> last year, there was $210,000 in the local budget under one of the articles toward the end of the budget, not not the, in, in the actual budget document, the Warren articles. The one uh, in this one? What's that? Is there one in this budget at this point in time? Not yet, no. You you won't see it in, it's it's a separate, it's a separate general fund budget that you will you will see when Christy and I kind of figure out which funding stream is paying for which item, but the proposal right now is that the the local contribution will go from two hundred ten thousand dollars, which has been the same for the last two years, to two hundred forty five thousand dollars in this year. We have a number here of the total budget. It's going to be added two hundred forty five thousand to that budget. It's going to add. It's going to go from two. It's already two hundred ten thousand dollars has already been raised in prior years. We have a bottom line of the budget right now that says we. No, are it's not. Here. It's not in this general fund. It's in. It's in a separate budget. It's in a separate fund okay. that you have not. You have not seen the document for yet. So our, bu our budget's going up another two hundred forty-five thousand dollars to raise. No, it's our, because it, every year it's been raised. Two hundred ten thousand has been raised. So oh, but I thought, okay. that, I thought the budget was. No, never mind. I'll talk. I'll, I'll figure it out later. I'll Actually, I, I'm going to follow up on that. And then Dave, I'll, I'll come back and see if you have other questions. So, okay. So I'm looking at the last page of the report we were talking about earlier. So it says budget total 35061. That includes this fund up to, wait, hold, hold on. Yes. That includes that minus the extra 35,000. No. Okay. So the 35061. It does, not, it does not include any adult education whatsoever. Okay. In revenue or expenses. Okay. All right. I will say when we get to the budget presentation um, on April 28th, it would be helpful to have all of those because that's something I've, I, even after four years, I'm still thoroughly confused by all of these different funds and things. You'll, you'll, you'll have a full general fund. You'll, you'll have both the adult education general fund budget and the general and the regular ed. Okay, it'd be nice to have historical documents because I afford that because I that's one department I don't think I've ever seen historical numbers for. Um, and I think it, it's good to have. So um, one of the questions that I always have um, about is around state funding, Christy. Oh, sorry, sorry, Dave, did you have other questions? No, I mean, it's, it's a relatively small part of the budget. It seems like it's doing good, good work, but we're only dealing with a hundred people. Yes. We're only dealing with a hundred. 
current, in, current enrollments year to date of academic students, yeah, we're, we have, I, I believe it was 108 people. Now, when you say year to date, is that from uh, from last July 1st or for, mm -hmm. for okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so we have enrollment um, probably doesn't actually go through a school year. It doesn't align with the school year totally, I imagine, right? Our enrollment? Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's a revolving yeah. enrollment throughout the year. Mm -hmm. um, we still have new students that are, you know, signing up and entering all the time. Um, and we do offer some summer um, courses in partnership with UROC um, for some prerequisites that um, are in the sciences that are needed for like healthcare um, workers. So there's, um, that is that is the year to date um, and there'll be more added um, throughout. And June 30th is our end of year where all of our reporting comes from. Anything else, Steve? No. no. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So one question I always I have is the state subsidy piece. And so if you look at the statute, as I'm sure you're aware, um, but for, for other people, if you look at the statute, it says that we actually get reimbursed about 50% um, of funds. And so a question for either Pete or Christy, is that something that we actually receive from the state or is it another place of um, unfunded, unfunded um, mandates is the wrong word, unfunded, down. Um, we actually have, um, we do receive the subsidy from the state and um, not every, you know, it's, it's a complicated formula, which we just before COVID, we were going to have our, um, one of our state um, adult ed team come to a meeting and explain it, Chelsea, because you had questions about it. Um, we get a very fair um, percentage. It's not 50% because some things are not um, uh, eligible for subsidy, but we, we really try to um, uh, plan our spending in a way that we maximize that contribution. And I believe um, for the coming year, I don't have the number off the top of my head, but I believe it's around 70,000 that we're receiving cash subsidy from the state. And what is the total budget, the total operating budget for adult ed? It is. Um, it's right around, I don't have the exact number, but it's right around, um, 350,000. Does that make sense, Pete? That's right. Yep. Okay. And does that, is that last year's or this year's? I'm, I'm really trying to figure out if that includes the distance learning coordinator, because that seems like the largest add to the budget. So this distance learning is being paid out of ESSER. Well, right, but I'm just, I'm still, I'm just asking for the, the total operating budget of the department. So does the 350 include, include that position or is this last year? It does not. It okay. does not. Okay. Okay. There, I, is there I, anything in the budget right now that, sorry, that, okay. that okay. is there anything that's going on right now that is not included in the 350 besides that? Um, I, well, the, uh, after school program grant is not, is not included in that, but I oh. believe that's the only other. How much is that? I'm always curious why after school is included under adult ed. It's just a random question. I don't know. Yeah, get. it's it, in our district. Historically, it was adult and community education that started the um, after school programs um, back, um, you know, maybe like 
30 years ago. Um, Tim Drescher had, had gotten uh, a grant and had started doing some of that programming. So when the 21st century program came in, um, that sort of um, took the most of the management, but there was this one grant that um, is from the Anonimo Foundation that we've just historically managed. And it's actually how I came into the district was managing that particular grant in after school, and so we've we've just um, we've just kept doing it because it's uh, yeah that's <laughs> it's a partner and it's um, it's roughly forty thousand a year, and most of it goes to um, instruction, um, and uh, there's a little bit of a supply budget in there as well. That makes sense, yeah, because if historically it was community. Yeah, that, that yeah. loops in nicely. We should pull it. We should include the word community again. It sounds nice. But I don't I know. know. Well, yeah, in the written in the written word, I, I do try to include that. Um, and the other piece of that um, is that um, sometimes it there is a small um, like admin fee that would come in and like pay for a piece of our admin assistance salary, but it's, it's really small because of just the way the grant is set up. Yeah, that makes sense. All right. Um, those are questions that I have. Is there anything else anyone else wants to say or questions that they have um, regarding adult ed? I just wanted to thank Christy for coming and uh, doing the presentation. She does a great job as the uh, director it's a really good program and has been under her leadership. So thank you, Christy. Thank you. Yeah, yeah and yes. I think that just putting it out there that um, we have we have a really um, strong academic program, and we're we're seen as a as a really great example on a statewide level. And we help to tutor some other um, programs in. Um, in making sure their data is all together and their filing systems and all of that um, sort of behind the scenes pieces. So you have a program you can be really proud of. That's great. Well, thank you for spending time tonight and giving us an overview. I have one more thank quick you. question. Oh. Sure. Just, just administration, your salary is included in that 350? Correct. Okay, thank you. Yep, all right. All right. Have Thank a you. good night. Thank we'll you. be here for a longer, so enjoy. Bye-bye. Right. <laughs> See you, you later. Dave, I really can't see you. <laughs> Eyebrows. There we go. I, 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 by the way, I'm not sure you really want to at this point. Yeah, but you know, when I only see the top of your head, I get what Lauren's saying about <laughs> you need to pull the camera down. <laughs> Well, the, the, question, the question is, Liam, the top of my head's not real great right now. It's losing too much hair. True, but you could be a monk. Um, and on that note, so, you'll, so, I'll, I'll, so I'll, when Christy and I confirm the numbers of, of the budget, we'll get you the copy in a format that will break out the different sources of, of, of where the expenses are being expended. Because you know, she's right. It's the, the general fund portion is probably three hundred fifty thousand dollars, but the total budget is probably closer to four hundred thousand, and that's before the distance learning coordinator is added into it. Just historically. General this, fund is 250. The general fund is 350. There's probably 50,000 in ongoing grants that support that on top of that. So 400,000 is the total budget. And then with the ESSER added to that this next year, that will be on top of that. Right. So that's, right. that's yeah. and you'll see that when we're just, we're just, she allocates different things differently. Adult ed grants work differently than the other federal grants. So we can allocate, it's, it's not always, it's, it's not always, um, Supplemental, so it can be used okay. differently. They're private. Some are private. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and I mean, that's it's great that we're leveraging private funds because that's what we've talked about for a while with needing a development person. That there are a lot of opportunities out there if we could capitalize on them. But I, I just want to get kind of that high level understanding because mm -hmm. adult yeah. ed is a question is a place where I get questions a lot. So I think it would be good to be able to to explain it with some competency or accuracy at the very least. It's, Can it's I get a really clarification, good. Chelsea? Yeah. Or like a, Peter, you said that the budget, the, 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 the general fund portion of the budget was 245 early on. Now it's- Yeah, that's, three, that's what three, I heard too. That's the, that's, the, that's the local contribution. 
So the balance of the 350 is so with, with 72,000 being funded through the through the um, state. state subsidy. The, the amount that we're raising for taxes is 245, right? That's what she's proposing for next year. Yes. But the, okay, so the 350 well is in in is that the total budget then plus the four plus the new the new position or is that not? No, the total budget is closer to four hundred thousand okay. plus the new position. Plus the new position. Okay. Fifty thousand of that is funded by grant funds. Okay. So we're left with three fifty. 75 of that is funded by the state. Okay. So that's 275. And there must be 30,000. Oh, the 30,000 is a pass through from the Midco School of Technology. So we have to raise their adult ed program through our, through our program. Although it's in a separate article in the budget documents when it goes to the public vote at the meeting. Just, it, you'll see the, so, so the bottom line is. And then, so you've got about 50K K more or more than that for the uh, new position. 75 new for the new position? The new position will be funded through the ESSER money grant. How much is it going to be? I, prob I, can't remember. I can't remember the number offhand that we budgeted for that person. That is it a full-time position or a part-time position? John, do you remember offhand what that is? It's a full-time position, and it's in the low 60s, I think. That's health insurance, so low 80s or mid-80s, actually, yeah, with health insurance. Something like that, Chelsea, yeah. I don't have it in front of me, but... Very much. All right. Any other adult ed before we close that off for the second time? Okay. All right, facilities... Facilities first, then transportation? Uh, nope, other way around. Okay, transportation. Well, only because I, that's how I have it in my slides. That's when transportation will be fast. Do you want us, you usually don't mind if we interrupt, correct? Never. All right. <laughs> I'll do so then. David laughs. David laughs. Because I have lots Never. of questions. <laughs> Is this one I prepared for? Because I had numbers to prepare with. Um. So, Peter, have you been home at all this week? What did you say? Have I been home? Well, yeah, I mean, you're here. You're, <laughs> I mean, you, you seem to be working too many hours. <laughs> well, I did spend yesterday in Waterville visiting Colby with my son. Oh, is he going to, it's, well, I guess, it, it actually, he probably would have decided already, right? Nope, he's got this week. He goes to Bowdoin on Thursday and Friday. So we'll see. Done. <laughs> that's, that's where he's down to, these two, believe it or not. He was, he was all in on University of North Dakota just a month ago. North Dakota? There's a story there, but we don't have time for it. <laughs> and we're also on television, so probably isn't fair to talk about high school <laughs> plans or college plans. What school's in Waterville? Colby. Colby College. Colby? Actually, Thomas is over there, too. I think there's another one. Okay, transportation. So uh, just to kind of go through this, you know, the idea that uh, we have a lot of new board members and people that may watch for the first time. It's going to be a little bit more of an overview at first. Uh, this is how we staff our transportation department. We have one director. We have one full-time mechanic uh, who's got to be probably <clears throat> who does the work of three. Uh, he's incredible. We have 16 full-time bus drivers. Uh, with the commercial licenses, and we have seven van drivers. The uh, for really our van drivers primarily are are driving our special ed vans. They do tutoring uh, runs, as well as they do um, they, they um, move our homeless from their uh, current residence to our schools or from 
the residents in our district to their schools out of district that we uh, are responsible for half of that cost. This has not changed at all in terms of numbers, probably in the last six years. There's been no changes in that. Uh, we've been very fortunate with having a very steady stream of drivers and, and really having not a lot of turnover and, and being able to replace them when we do uh, have one that eventually retires. So um, it is, it's tight, uh, but our director also drives uh, when he needs to. And they haven't called me yet. That's a good thing. The miles we drive. This is something that I've been working on, kind of understanding as we as we look towards electric. But we drive our buses a total of one hundred ninety thousand dollars, one hundred ninety thousand miles a year. It's almost a thousand miles per day total uh, in the district, and then we drive our vans. Uh, a lot more than that. So 260,000 miles in a year for our vans. And again, a lot of those are for, for out of district placements. So they go back and forth to Chelsea, to Waterville, to Bath, to Belfast, uh, wherever the student's placement is. We have uh, 18 large 17, 77 passenger uh, buses. We have two lift buses. We have eight vans. And we have three suburbans uh, all moving students around almost every day. While we only have 16 drivers and 16 runs for our general ed runs, uh, we always have a couple spare buses and a lot of them are being used uh, when, when one or two are out, of, out uh, getting serviced or uh, getting warranty repairs, which sometimes has to happen down in Southern Maine or occasionally down in Connecticut they get run down there for work. We do our best to limit that. Uh, and Jamie has actually become a warranty shop for some of our diesel buses. Now yeah, I'll send you all the, all the information about this, but this is a list of our buses. Uh, out of our, our bus aging is actually, we're getting, you know, well, as we've been trying to replace uh, one or two buses a year for the last eight years since I was here. Uh, the, the age of our fleet is actually getting much younger than it used to. So I think our average age right now is about, our, our average model year is probably 2016. Uh, but you can see even the, the 16s have close to 100,000 miles on them. Uh, they last about 12 years, the way we've been running them. And we'll continue to work on replacing them one or two a year for the next few years. Although as we decide the direction we go in electric, that's gonna kind of change how we do that because at some point having a, a youthful bus fleet will work against us and some of the grants that are being used to replace them. Uh, Can you define um, what when you say like their useful life is 12 years, um, what kind of criteria are we using for that decision? The frame. It's really, it's really the entire, the, the reason why they, why we have to limit our buses to about 12 years is that's about when, the, when we have to make a decision to either go, on, go in and replace the entire frame because lots of the pieces are good. I mean, the, a diesel engine will last much longer than, than you know, 225 or 250,000 miles. But the, the, the liquid salt that's being put on the roads right now is destroying these buses where even after one year, uh, they're beginning to uh, you see signs of corrosion. And to stay ahead of that has been uh, nearly impossible. And so we do it as best we can. I mean, ideally we'd have a, you know, our, low, our own uh, wash bay with an undercarriage washer to keep that clean, but uh, that's, um, that's been the limiting factor in terms of what's causing us to have to replace our buses after 12 years. Pete, I have a question about that, if I may. Have, have uh, there ever been conversations about using uh, Cosmoline undercoating on the buses or doing something like that in-house? Because they- Not that I'm aware. Not like I'm pretty sure with Jamie. 
cosmoline or a wool wax. And then there are a couple other different treatments that are used on um, passenger vehicles. I was just talking to a guy about it the other day. I don't know if that's even worth talking about, but if rust is a real issue, I just wonder if a once a year spray of that undercarriage with, with cosmoline might, might be worthwhile. So yeah, just, I, the, the conversations may have happened. I wasn't part of them, but I'll check, I'll check with Jamie and, and to Roy. All right. Yeah. I I'd, I'd know that I'd love to know the answer to that. Yeah, I would too. Uh, I know sometimes we're limited because of some of the federal regulations on some of these, you know, passenger buses, uh, putting certain types of you know, chemicals on them. I don't know. I, I'm just, I, I'm just guessing right now, but I will check to see about that. The, um, you know, the electric bus, if we go that route, it's all composite. There is no such thing as rusting. So the composite, yeah. it's, it's, it's a sealed undercarriage, which actually will prevent that. So there's, that's a, there's, there's actually, you know, another advantage because the useful life of those buses, you know, will really just be based on battery life and the other unique characteristics of, of electric bus. So there, so do we know yet what the useful life will be? Because I know some of them are too new to this area to really have, I don't know if there's enough good data yet. I, I doubt there's good data anywhere yet on, on any of those. Okay. Um, one other question. So I know some places will replace frames. Why do we decide to replace buses versus replacing the frames? Cost effectiveness. I mean, I think that you know, we 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 sell our we sell the buses you know, for what we can at the end. Uh, those that want to put money into frame, but I think then you're you're dealing with just the, the bus being out of service more often. You know, buses that have frames and other, it's not it's not just the frame either, other components. I think that this just keeps we we can we can work with fewer buses if we have them on the road more. If you have the, the you know the older buses are going to be off the road more, they're going to be you know in repairs more often. So it's not just, uh, you know, I think it's probably not just that. I think it's, it's, a, it's more of a comprehensive approach that, that you know, Jamie has kind of decided that that's, you know, allows us to, you know, keep our fleet nimble. Uh, but I, I can check out more of that. I can, I can. Is there, is there a reason you went to the Suburbans over the vans or that's just to set just a better price at the time? Uh, they don't make the vans anymore. The, uh, the the Chrysler minivan was discontinued, so we so we couldn't get those anymore. Uh, this these these uh, suburbans were were allowable under the first CRF funds that we received from the federal government, and it seemed to make sense that they would have, from my vantage, multiple uses. Uh, they're, they're great on, you know, 17, they're safer on, on 17 when you're taking students to Chelsea. Uh, they're a little bit bigger, so they have the ability to possibly carry more than one student. Uh, you know, they can be separated a little bit more. Uh, and third, they, they, when they're not being used for uh, student transportation, they can be used, you know, in the district for other uh, uses. They have trailer hitches. So we can pull our trailers around. We can move stuff around. Maintenance can use them. Facilities can use them. Is there a reason you stopped using the Toyota vans? Or are they just a different one than theirs? The Toyotas are, they're, they're being moved into the um, uh, maintenance department already. Right. So the other, the other six vans, the one to say other, the other ones to say other make, those are all Chrysler. Yeah. Well, I was thinking, I, you have a Chrysler's, but you have two to earlier Toyotas. I know yeah, they still make like that. Those are, those are I was going to say, they've got another 100,000 miles on them. Yeah. Or more. <laughs> they've been moved into uh, either moving food around between buildings or maintenance. Why aren't, why aren't we buying more Toyota vans? Or are they rather than the Chrysler's? No, it's just I don't know. It's been, ten, it's been 10 years since we bought a Toyota. Yeah. Um, I'm, pr I'm partial to them only because I have one, but yeah. that's no, I, and mine's, mine's hitting 320 right now. So. so it looks like we only have about five vehicles left to replace. What is, I know you said you've been trying to do the one to two buses a year. 
what is the overall cycle of replacement that you're trying to accomplish? Like how many, is that like the entire bus fleet turns over every 10 years, every eight years? What does that look like? <laughs> we've never gotten, we've never gotten so far into the discussions that actually had, had these vehicles in a position where we actually could put together a plan like that. So these, these, four, these four that are marked, so two are gonna be replaced next year and two the year after, basically. So, th so those are kind of the end of this year. They'll either be taken out of service or put into a, um, a replacement bus position. Uh, and then the, the, two, the, two, the two 2010s are meant to be replaced in fiscal 23. Is that something that we could potentially slow down? Because it yeah. does seem like a, I think we're going to get more funding for the electric buses in the future and older fleets are actually beneficial, but we have so many newer buses that it seems like you mentioned earlier that some of those older buses are used because the buses are out of service, but it seems like that's not as much of an issue with this newer fleet. It won't, it won't be. I mean, after, after this next two rounds of, of purchases, We'll, we'll, we'll probably have to just go to one bus, one bus a year, and, and that could be the electric bus. Well, so why, why keep up keep our current eighteen buses if those calculations are going to change in the future? Well, we still need to keep the. Well, we have twenty buses. We keep, we keep twenty on on. We, we keep twenty buses in the fleet, based on sixteen runs, having four spares. But you listed eighteen on the, on the last slide. Eight, two or two are lift. Two have lifts, so two are sixty-six passenger. Eighteen or seventy-seven passenger. Okay, sorry. So how many? How many times do we end up using all twenty of those buses at the same time? Or that Rarely. they're out of service? Like the combination means that we don't have another bus. Almost all the time, hmm. we're, we're we're always using it because occasionally we'll have a you know one one won't be used it won't be because of out of service it'll be used for a field trip or for a sporting event so we would hire a driver or give another driver hours uh, so the bus would be used. Okay, okay, thanks. Yeah, this is uh, this is. This is quite the logistical position in this department. Uh, in terms of looking ahead for the budget for next year, I've just kind of gone through and identified some of the increases. So in the regular education portion of transportation, the salaries are uh, increased by uh, just under $60,000. Uh, and more than half of that is really just cost of living and step. Probably uh, two thirds of that amount is uh, is because of just you know salary increases. Uh, the other is really just adjusting uh, some of the additional uh, hours that our bus drivers are working. The, the runs are a little bit longer than they used to be, so we've had to adjust some uh, budgets from you know six and a half hours a day to seven hours a day, and that's what the balance of that is. We've wrong way. We have increased our budgeted fuel consumption um, cost, not consumption, by sixty-eight thousand uh, dollars. That's another four percent to the to the uh, transportation budget. And then I think we've identified that we our net increase in our bus lease amounts next year will be ten thousand dollars, and that will cover the all the leases that we will be anticipating for the buses next year. Get, and I, all, all the lease money gets reimbursed in the following years through subsidy. So, so okay. So one of the things that I was looking at, um, well, actually, you're probably let, let me save all of this for later. I think that might be easier. And one quick question: Is that four percent increase in fuel over what you spent this year, or what, or what you're planning on spending this year, or what you budgeted this year? That's just the, it's, a, it's actually a 70% increase in the fuel cost, seven zero, but that represents a 4% increase 
to the transportation budget and as a whole. So that 4% represents what that amount is to the budget, to, to that article amount. Okay. So, but it's a, but it's a 70% increase in fuel cost period. Correct. So these numbers are for the whole budget, not for the whole transportation budget, not for the, transpor for the, for the transportation portion of the budget. Yes. Okay. Not the salaries haven't increased just 3%. They've increased more than that. Uh, correct. Yeah, okay. Thank you. On special education, we have, uh, again, I, I, we used to budget this uh, as a lump sum number in our contracted services line. Um, this year I went and I ended, we identified exactly which drivers were running which runs and how much time they were using uh, spending on those special ed runs. Uh, so that comes out to $69,000. We took out the contracted line. Uh, so it's a net increase uh, adjustment of $9,000. Is that yeah. in the special education line or in the regular education line? Or I guess when you do by department, you've combined all of that into the transportation, it's in, right? It's all in transportation. And what we try to do is we, we identify the special education portions of transportation, which has not been done historically for all those years, because this is identified as a reimbursable cost by the state. So, the, so that's the why the number in the budget is 86,000, but the 60,000 is just the special ed portion. Right. Okay. Gotcha. And then we also uh, would be, you know, the uh, after school program uh, being funded locally. That's the portion that we've, that we, that we've kind of moved from the 21st century grant to the local budget over time. Uh, so this is being, this is moving uh, that officially into the budget, uh, which represents 46,250. And that's because the 21st century grant is a, is a grant that uh, decreases each year over the life of, life of it. And this is the RSU's contribution to the after-school program for transportation. And this, is, this is three routes on three drivers for two and a half hours a day. And generally it's overtime, a lot of it. Forty-six. Uh, that this particular number is increasing to the district every year. Then, right? This will increase. Well, it will increase by the salary. The salaries, yes. So I meant, what I meant is, this used to be funded by a grant, and it's the grants gradually going away. Yes, but this is the full cost of the transportation portion of it. So, so there are other pieces that may fold into the grant into into the general fund over time too. Unless, but we're also reapplying for the grant. Okay, but you haven't accepted. got the grant. You haven't got the grant yet. This this is a four year. It's a four year grant, and it's about time to, to renew it. So it will, re, it will restart itself. But does it every year decrease the amount you're covered, or does because you yeah. you made yes, it, it decreases so, every year. So you, the first year of the grant, you get more coverage than the fourth year. Correct. Yeah. And so when you reapply for it, that same thing's going to happen, right? Correct. And what's the difference between the first year and the last year? It starts out at 300,000 and it ends at about, I want to say 100, 150. How much does the, does the 300,000 cover everything that it's, the grant was applied for? It did. Yes. So by the last year, we're only covering 50%. Correct. Okay. Thank you. This is another, this is a piece of the budget that we're adding back to it after uh, a couple of years of not funding field trips. And so this is how that breaks out. These are all estimated amounts. Uh, so regular education, those come into the, uh, those are you know, really split between uh, Article One regular ed activities, uh, classroom field trips primarily is what that includes uh, for all, all, all six schools. Again, this, and that, that, that's, that went from zero 
227,750. Uh, special ed has increased by 10,500. We had left some in there because some of those activities were really necessary for the special ed uh, programs. Uh, not a lot, but this probably doubles what was there. So uh, the increase in this, this uh, works with life skills students, taking them uh, to, to, for swimming uh, programs is one example of what uh, that goes for. Uh, $6,000, go ahead. I was just gonna say, and these are included in the field trip lines for each of the individual schools, correct? Correct. And so a lot of this is done in-house through our own drivers. And we just do a journal entry to kind of fund that into the right area to make sure that it shows up in the budget right. Okay. We, um, what, what, we, what we charge the schools is um, we charge the school $35 for every hour and then a dollar for every mile. And that's how we come up with the calculation uh, because a lot of times the drivers are on overtime. So We've done this calculation to figure out what the actual driver cost is. And then the, the dollar a mile, which might have to go to $1.50 after these fuel charges. Uh, but uh, that's what we charge for just wear and tear on the bus. Okay. So are you, actually, that's an interesting question. So when you're budgeting for the 70% increase in gas right now, is that all of our gas usage or might it be more because the field trips? Uh, well, I think that that's so. What the, what it means is that the depending on how we calculate the cost of a field trip, when we tell the schools how to budget for their field trips, when they you know, when they put in their forms requesting one, they will just get less field trips out of their budget than they would have at lower gas costs. So we didn't we didn't increase. We thought it, we thought it was just enough to get at least the funding back into its old level. It might. It might result in fewer trips than were previously allowed, like that we could afford. Um, but no, we didn't. We didn't. We didn't factor in an increased fuel charge in the budget numbers. Nor did we, you know, factor in increased wages that we would every year. You know, it's kind of been a. It's been a kind of a, an estimated formula for a couple of years now. I mean, we did. We did this calculation about a year and a half ago, two years ago, at thirty-five dollars and one dollar. So are we budgeting then twice for some expenses? Because if we budget for fuel in this transportation line, but we're also budgeting it in the field trip line. Um, I mean, it's a small amount. I just don't, I think. Yeah, I, just... um, I guess the answer would be, it depends or probably, there's probably is some overlap. I mean, I mean yeah, I, I can't imagine that we actually, that I went through it and broke out exactly the miles, but I would say that I probably, because we didn't, haven't done field trips for a while, that our more recent usage numbers are probably more accurate or, or more accurately reflect non-field trip amounts of fuel. Okay, okay thanks. Alternative education are the two programs at the high school and the middle school. You know, programs that they would take students down to Herring Guide or to some other uh, uh, areas where they have partnerships with. Uh, clubs, that would be uh, chorus or band competitions. Uh, that would be for some of the non-sporting events. Uh, that's, uh, that's an increase from zero to 10,000. And then sports themselves, we never not budgeted for them. So this is actually an increase that, that would probably take into account some of the increased costs that we have been seeing in some of the sports. Uh, but that's, I believe it's gone from total of 75,000 to 86,5. It's, I believe it's somewhere, that's just, this is just the increase, isn't it? Again, in terms of sports and special ed, those are increases. There were numbers in there already, but the other three are, should be just total costs and the increase equals the total cost. So all that's been included in the budget, the versions that you've seen. The, um, what's also included is uh, 14 hours of professional development per driver. 
So we budget an extra two days per uh, school year employee, uh, which drivers are all school year employees. So they're budgeted for the 175 school days, uh, 11 holidays, and then they're budgeted for two extra days for professional development that we'll be using uh, outside their, their normal activities. And, and is that what, employee training and development or professional services as a category? This is not. This is actually right in their salary number. This is actually just budgeted two extra days. Oh, because it's it's money we pay to them. It's just, yeah. It's just, so we we're, we're going to. So what we're doing is we're just we're setting up a, a kind of a mandatory professional development and training program uh, this next year, and uh, devising kind of a, a curriculum so that our drivers. Um, not only are up to date on procedures, but also do the do things the same way. For example, they all should be doing their evacuation procedures the same way because a student might be on a different bus with a different driver and may have learned one way, not the other, or the driver may be filling in for another route. And so it's important that we We've identified it as we've identified it as an opportunity, so we're going to take advantage of that knowledge and begin doing some things like this. We think that there are skills that uh, our drivers may not have really worked on since they took their test. Uh, you know, parallel parking and some of the things that you know you do when you when you have to go take your road test with cones, and uh, we can do that in a, in a fun way with with kind of driver rodeos, and we can actually do some things that uh, we think will be fun. And uh, you know, do a you know, king of the king of the bus garage award or something for the winner for each one of these you know, quarterly events. But we also want to make sure that our drivers are skilled in first aid uh, and CPR. Uh, you know, basic life basic life support uh, is a consideration, but you know, they're required to have first aid and and spill cleanups on their buses. And we just want to make sure that everybody knows how to use it and they use it correctly. So we are going to see if we can work with the fire department as well as our nursing staff to get the drivers uh, educated in that. Also allergies, you know, how to deal with an allergy, how to, you know, how to deal with an EpiPen, how to, how to know that you have a student on your bus that, that might have that uh, prop, uh, issue. Uh, the um, accident procedure, same thing, same reason. You wanna have the same procedure. You want each driver to do it the exact same way. Who they call first, what they do first, how they secure the bus, uh, again, and evacuations. And then again, you know, how, how, you, how we work around railroad crossings are very unique with a commercial vehicle. You've got to do it a certain way. And then new statutes. You know, they're, um, I know when I was riding with drivers and they were watching, they were kind of riding with me. You know, I was learning one way and they were saying, no, we don't, you, don't, you don't have to do that. And we went to the book and sure enough, the book says you have to do that. And it's things like you know, putting your indicator on when you're making, when you're Pick up a student. Nobody uses their. They've got big lights all over their buses. They don't need to put their indicator on telling they're stopping. They got big yellow lights and red lights, but they do. So there's new statutes that we want to make sure that our drivers are knowledgeable in. And then we're going to start you know, this next month actually with formalized driver meetings where I'll be part of the driver meeting and kind of uh, making sure that the, that we set the expectations that this is where we're going with our with our um, department. Uh, and then formal, formalized evaluations of ride-alongs is something that you know, we really haven't done. These are, these are I think, something that we're, we're weak on and that we'll uh, need to, uh, we've identified it and so we're gonna fix it. This is all in the budget. What's not in the budget is a transportation coordinator. And this is, uh, for lack of a better term, an assistant director or a transportation supervisor, but it, it's not a new position. What it's going to be is going to be a driver who has added responsibility, so they won't be doing you know, extra runs or, or uh, transportation or, or washing buses between their runs. They'll actually have another job and they'll be working with uh, the director and the uh, administrative assistant, Paula, who really does a lot of the uh, scheduling uh, but they'll be working on the professional development and training for the drivers. They'll be working on the coordination of all trips, uh, whether it be special ed or our field trips. You know, right now we have our, our general ed 
our, our general bus drivers are offered extra hours for trips. So there's gotta be a mechanism in place that is consistent and fair that uh, is outlined in the contract that we can make sure is, is done properly. So we wanna, that, that trip, co that, co that coordinator position will also take on that responsibility. Also work on other projects like uh, really digitizing our transportation system and, and you know, using route, routing, routing, routing software so we are being as efficient as possible. And finally, it really, it's, uh, it's a matter of you know, setting up a line of succession in the department. Uh, there needs to be a career path in that department. Um, you know, our director, you know, we've, we've talked and at some point, you know, he's gonna retire. So, you know, we've talked about kind of making sure that we have people that are in the wings that could step in, you know, even when he's, even when he's out for a day that would be able to have that ability to step in. So that line of succession is something that I wanna work in all of our departments. What so it could include, go ahead. I was just gonna say devil's advocate here. Um, why add increasing admin responsibilities rather than incorporating some of those into existing positions? Um, for instance, you mentioned that the director sometimes drives. Why not have the have somebody else drive, which is cheaper, and have the director do this? The director only drives when there is no other driver available. I mean, it's it's a, it's a last. That's that's the last ditch. You know, decision. It, so okay, it, but so why wouldn't hard. these why wouldn't these be things that a director would do? They, they, they could. I mean, they, they would be. They, there's some of the things that they do do, but there's just the capacity. It's a pretty substantial department with a lot of moving parts, especially with special ed. So we so it it there needs to be help right now. You know, he's got a he's got a half time admin assistant that does a lot of the scheduling. Uh, that's not enough, and she doesn't want to work anymore. Uh, again, this is really to get an extra driver trained to do some more administrative tasks when he's not or she is not driving. That's the idea. Okay. So this just... Uh, goes through the budget. So it's the, the budget as presented is uh, just over $2 million for the uh, transportation. Uh, it's a 15% increase over last year's budget, which was uh, intentionally reduced uh, because we knew we wouldn't be doing a lot of um, you know, driving that we would normally do. Uh, you can see from 21 to 22, we actually saw a decrease even though wages you know, increased uh, and benefits increased. So uh, we actually uh, really held the, the line on last year's budget. Uh, so this year is just reflecting, putting those programs, it's, it's reflecting the normal increases, but it's also reflecting the, uh, the return to uh, normalization. Uh, and then a huge part of the increase, more than half of it is just the fuel cost. Got a couple of questions. So when you're putting these numbers up here, I'm looking at the budget that we talked about earlier, the 79059 budget. Um, and it says two years prior, so fiscal year 21, that this budget was at 1694800 and then 1593, et cetera, and then 1902. So why why are the numbers different? Because I've included all the other general ed and other uh, parts of transportation that are uh, that are that are funded in different articles in the budget by itself. Okay, so this number this is, is this is different. transportation. This is all transportation throughout the budget uh, and throughout all the different articles. Okay. So I wonder. I thought I thought I I, I could have done it either way. I thought thought this was just a better way to isolate it. And, and you know, we talked about cross sections. This this takes you know that cross section of anything with twenty seven anything with twenty seven and that. Third, that second position or third position, 27XX, you know, 00577. That's what, I, that's what I tried to do. I thought that was a, a better way of representing this budget. But that's fine. I just wanted to make sure I yeah. understood why I, I was looking I, at two different numbers. So it took me a while to realize it too. Uh, Is this the end of the transportation? Or do transportation you yeah, so really it's, it's not, so again, it's, it's not a lot of changes. 
it's, it's really just more, you know, more adjustments. And then the big, the big change is the addition, the, the, the adding back of, of, of field trips and the, uh, the fuel. Okay, so Dave, why don't you do questions and then I've got a couple of really specific questions. Go. I keep getting confused. Okay, all right, let me ask my questions and then feel free to jump in afterwards. Um, okay, so the transportation budget, at least in the, the document you provided us, is at $309,000-ish um, as an increase. And that includes a couple of subtractions. So the 86,000 for the contracted, which you've already talked about. So I understand that one. Um, and then there's an equipment cost that was like $50,000. What was that taken out? So the equipment, that other there's, equipment. Two, there's, there's, there's a 50,000 and right above it, there's a 23,000 or something. 24, yeah. There. Yeah, 24, those, 25. Those two together were moved into the lease line. So those were the lines that I used in prior budgets because I didn't know what we'd be buying. I knew we'd be buying something. We didn't have any, we didn't have any budget buses, you know, uh, lined up in the, in, the, uh, in the state model, but we knew, that we'd be, we knew that we thought we'd have to buy something. And that was where, because that was more of a generic placeholder for vehicle and not specific to bus principal. So, so where, right. and where is the lease line? <laughs> It's, it's like three lines below it, I think. In, like, uh, Redemption of principal bus? Yes. Oh, okay. Because that was one question was, so that the 84,000 is being added. Oh, and that's actually, that probably, that probably those two numbers together probably add up pretty close. That's, and those three numbers together is the $10,000 net increase that I talked about. Okay. That was, that was where I had a question there. Was, that's, that's, okay. that's, that's where that all kind of plays out. Okay. 10K. All right. That, that makes sense. Okay. So there's also an additional, hold on. I'm just running my math now that I've got that information. Okay. So that, so those two things are actually offsetting each other. I guess what I, the question I was kind of wondering is how do we get to 309? Because so field trips are about 300,000. We've added 67 in energy. And have we, we have not added 84 for a bus. Um, so how do we get to 300,000? I feel like I'm still short a few numbers. So we added, we've only, we added about 70,000 for field trips. Actually, you're gonna send us a slide check, correct? Yeah, I'll send it all, yeah. And we can... I will run the numbers and if I still have questions, okay. I will let you know. Because I think once I look at these numbers, that will probably, it'll probably answer the question. Okay. <clears throat> I'm confused here. You're talking $3 million. I'm looking at the, the total by art, article, uh, the summary by article, and it says 1.8 million for the transportation budget. So trans I've got so 1.9. <laughs> Why do you have 1.84? 1.842 is what it says there. Which budget are you looking at? I'm looking at the it's it's called what budget by article uh, version 1-2A 416. It's a summary. Actually, look at the report number at the top right. So so let's let's, let's let me answer the question. I think it's the same question, it's the same answer that Chelsea and I went through with her first question, is that this the way the way I the way I um, cross sectioned transportation tonight. It it goes it, it 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 represents more than just the transportation article. It actually represents transportation costs that are also embedded in Article One, regular education, and Article Two, special education. So there so it, it does it includes it includes more than just the transportation the general transportation article. My apologies for not uh, no, it's totally okay. processing it. No, and, and also, and the big, and also a big part of that is also is um, the the transportation involved in uh, extracurricular sports. That's a, that's a huge number uh, between the two schools. What? So, uh, uh, forgive me. What what is buried in the 
in, in the individual schools? Is it just the extracurricular sports and? Um, in the, so in, in Article One, in the in the regular education part of the article, the transportation that's in there are field trips for the classroom field trips, field trips for gifted and talented, field trips for adult education uh, for adult uh, alternative education. In Article Two, the special ed, there's field trips for life skills, and there's field trips for um, I think that's the only uh, for like Special Olympics field trips. In Article Four, which is extra and co-curricular, I believe is for Article Four. That's where you'll see the um, the sporting, the sports and tr and club trips. And so, and then and then Article. Uh, whatever it is, eight for transportation is, is this the general education transportation. And so what I tried to do tonight was try to include all of those pieces of transportation, no matter what article they eventually get reported to the state in. Where I get confused, okay, and it, it doesn't take much. Um, your transportation, the, the parts you're including with the schools is about 40% of the transportation budget. Right? No. No. You said the total transportation budget is like over three million, right? Uh, two. Is it too flat? Okay. Okay. I am very confused. My apologies. <laughs> and field trips by themselves are wouldn't be more than about seventy thousand. I will figure it out eventually. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for your patience. Well, swing by the office. You know, you you can find me, and I can go through it. We can kind of, you know, it helps me. Your questions do help me explain it to others at the same at the same time. I, I mean, I, I try to use it as a as a learning tool for myself too when I try to present these. So I present them in a more clear way than I did last time, whatever that might be. Okay, so we have three minutes for facilities. Um, how do we wanna handle, I don't wanna keep people too late, but I also, we don't really have time to add things later. So how do you guys wanna handle that? Well, unless you wanted to just do, a, do an extra night for facilities, we can, I mean, we can kind of touch on just the, we can, we can touch on the, the general fund portion of it, which is, our, which is what I was gonna to do tonight. But we can also then, you know, kind of touch on some of those other areas that you wanted to talk about that will eventually be in the capital improve of the capital expenditure fund. Yeah, I really do think we need to have a conversation about the CIP and such, yep. and the debt and all of that before we approve or or vote on rather the um, whatever the loan that the state is forgiving part of. Because I, I, I'm a bit concerned about how all these pieces play together. And it feels like we're looking at them all very separately. And I we need to pull them together. Um, well, so it help? might be worth having that extra meeting. So let's, let's just quickly talk about calendar. So next Tuesday, we have a meeting. And that's when we're going to go over the staffing, correct? Yes. Okay. And the big picture overview, I assume you'll do pieces of during the superintendent's budget, because a lot of that will be looped in pretty easily into that conversation. Um, but my under, my impression was that we didn't have, we couldn't meet this Thursday, which would be the only other time we could go into facilities. We, well, we can't meet this Thursday. We can or we cannot? We can, I, I can't. Okay. Uh, that's fine. I'm actually really looking forward to not having three meetings. Well, that was your, was your idea. Yeah, well, that's because I'm so tired of three meetings in one in every week. For but I do. But I, again, I, I think that we should, and I and I would, I think we should reach out to Lauren too, because I think this could be a good board, a full board workshop on the facilities again to make sure that we do this. Could we not? Could we not tack facilities onto the staffing discussion? I mean, I, I don't think it would take that long. Sure. Actually, that's a good point. That's a good point because okay. yeah, we don't need. Um, particularly if we get the info over the weekend, we'll be, we won't have to ask a lot of these questions like 
because we can figure out some of these questions on our own. And we're, not, um, and we're not asking for a lot of changes with staffing either. So it's, I would say it's relatively straightforward. Okay. All right. I think, I think we may have a few more questions just in general, because we do have new, new board members. I think that, that they will probably spend more time on it than say we would have last year, just because there, there's some, some sort of high level, this is where people are in, in each department. Um, but we've also gotten a little bit of that already. Okay. So I like that idea, John, good suggestion. Okay, so let's let's do that. So next week we'll be staffing and facilities. And yeah, I, I we probably do need a CIP workshop. But the only thing is that I feel like we're about to make some decision, big decisions around um, capital improvements in this budget cycle. So that's why I'm kind of pushing for it to be done before we approve the budget, because I think we need that. But it sounds like we can do that, right? Because some of that depends on whether you guys have the, the documents ready and all that by next week or the end of this week. Which documents are you thinking? The, just the, that uh, you know, that list that um, Steve shared with us last year, just an update of that list yep. alongside what's being taken <clears throat> care of yeah, by I'll, the state I'll, loan I'll, and then what I'll, we're I'll send, the I'll, send, I'll send the presentation that I have because it includes, I'll send the, the full presentation to you tonight, my, okay. my slideshow. You'll have the list of the CIP, well, I'll, I, can, I can send along the updated CIP and then, but the list on the slideshow also goes through what he would love to do next year on okay. that list. So I have that listed out for you. I mean, it's, it's almost a million dollars, so it's gonna be, it's, it's a wish list. Right, and, and this also, is why I think we need to have a sense of how are we actually gonna also, make all also, this happen. It's also gonna be restricted by capacity. I mean, because we have, not only are we looking to hopefully uh, put the foundations in for modulars this summer. We're looking to do all the uh, SRF type projects, you know, starting this summer. Uh, plus we have, you know, the, the regular things that we want to do around the buildings, including, you know, like you mentioned, the Cushing roof. I mean, there, there, are, there are roofs around and there are other projects. So I'm, you know, my biggest concern is capacity and people. And so I, I, I'm- uh, My I'm, biggest concern is the money too. <laughs> I mean. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I hear you. I, I'm not <laughs> discounting that at all. <laughs> but okay. if you can't do it, then yeah. Right, well, I think that's where, I mean, one of the things that we really do need to start start doing on a finance and facilities committee is, can we stop screen sharing? Because it's really distracting. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I think we really do need to have just that long-term planning and we know what we need. Now we need to start figuring out where it's going to go and where the holes are. Um, and I think that will help, that will help me at least feel comfortable with the votes that we have upcoming. If I know how the other stuff is going to be sort of taken care of. Dave? Yeah, our, we're talking about fun, some more financing of stuff. Have the rates changed at all recently? I haven't gone out. I haven't checked rates for what we what we. The state though is funding it is zero percent, so the rates don't aren't impacted. Okay. I know the mortgage rates are up about the point and a half or two points. Yeah. So. Okay. All right, so I think we have a plan. Uh, Dave, John, anything you guys want to add or questions or anything? So I have a report on staffing sort of by class size. Is that something that would be helpful for you as projected class sizes for next year? Yeah, that would be great. Or even, yeah, because actually next year would probably be more useful than historical given that I don't know that right now class sizes are in any way accurate. <laughs> Historical doesn't help me either because I, I have to deal with what I've got in front of me for classes, but I do have it rolled forward. The only thing we don't have are firm kindergarten numbers, but you can kind of count on them being about the same as last, as last this, this year. So. Okay. Yeah. yeah. If one year, blah, blah, I can speak. One year you gave us the, what you provide to the state um, and it, it was just like a printout of everything. And I figured that is really, that's fine. Cause that's a easy for you guys to print out and B it, it gave, it definitely answered the questions that I had. 
The other yeah. thing I was looking at, because I was trying to find budget documents online um, on the website, and I noticed back, by the way, those the budget numbers are missing in many places. Um, but I noticed back in 2015 or so, 2016, um, you guys actually included a nice little table of just, it was like full-time employees, school, like custodians, teachers, it just in a single page. Um, so that could also be um, something that um, would be helpful as well. Um, in full transparency, I don't know where that came from. So if I had it in that format, I could do it, but I'm not sure unless it's in Neo or something that Allie might have. I don't know, but I'll, I'll, find, I'll look for it, but I don't know. Right, that's fair. Yeah, I just assume that it might be a document. I, I'm trying to get documents that you're already using internally so that it's not actually like a hassle to create. Yeah, but what I have listed all out by school, Chelsea, so it lists like, it, it'll list Cushing School, X number of kids in third grade, teacher. I won't put the names in there, but you'll yeah. figure it out. Right. Yeah. yeah, I'm not. I'm not interested in names. I'm just just no, the data. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And I'll, I, we can look at that. I don't. I don't know what that report was. That's probably we didn't, the we didn't do. I mean, I I did it with Leon. Yeah, I don't remember even doing that. That was like the first no, year in the district. Who's it Leon? Leon. It was. It was in the two weeks. Before John started, after, after I started and before John started, I worked with a, a superintendent who we had to, we actually had to rewrite all the budget documents for the current for the current fiscal year. So, so so I started I started in, in July in fiscal in fiscal fifteen, wow. and so we were actually rewriting all the documents for the public at that time after the budget was already passed. I, I see. Think, so you got to learn the budget very well. <laughs> I think he was one of three, one of three superintendents that served in the same fiscal year. Wow. Not including me. I work, I work for all three of them. Fun. <laughs> stories, stories, stories. First year right. you were involved here, it must have been a lot of fun. Oh, it was. Well, they hired me. They hired, they hired me two weeks after Pete. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm just glancing over the list and it looks like um, yeah, you guys have the list and it sounds like um, we've answered your question about it. So that, anything else? I think that's good. All right. All right. All right. Thank you all for